new study today. Um, probably some of you, well, I know some of you have, uh, have seen the new TV series Revolution. It is a um, show about, um, I guess about maybe 2030 would be somewhere around the dates now, maybe 2020. Basically, about our time period, um, all the power in the world just turned off. Anything electronic, anything that requires electricity uh, was done. And the chaos and the aftermath of the results of that uh, are what the world is left in. So there's turmoil, and there's chaos, and there's change of governments, change of power. Um, and so uh, we've talked about this idea of what if those kind of things happened before, and so I don't think that's new for our imagination. And today as we begin to look at the book of James in the New Testament, uh, I found uh, as I was thinking about this and praying about this, there was a lot in common uh, between the book of James and between this series. Now you might be thinking, well, you know, what could the book of James and this secular uh, TV show really have in common? Uh, and so I will be drawing out the elements uh, of that because uh, that's just how I roll. I like to associate um, things with my personal life and uh, how I think people see the world uh, with the scriptures, I think it helps us understand. And so, would you turn with me to James chapter 1, verse 1, where we see this introduction from the author, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the dispersion greetings. All right, so uh, it's not really a mystery uh, as far as who the author is. It says there right away. Now, it's, debate, it's debated, you know, was this James, the brother of Jesus? Was this another leader? Um, you know, we can't say for sure. I think probably um, it was James, uh, the brother of Jesus. Uh, he was uh, a leader in the Jerusalem church. He was the head of the Jerusalem council. And uh, this book was probably written pretty early on. Uh, as far as the New Testament is concerned, probably one of the very first books. I think most scholars put it about 60 A.D. And so this was a time in Christianity where there was still a very strong Jewish theme in how everything was. All right, so you kind of have to put on your filter, your lens, to really understand some of the things that are happening because it's it's yet to become a concept that. Uh, Christianity is for everybody. It's for the Gentiles. I mean, it's been, it's been stated, and Jesus stated it later in his ministry, but it's not really caught on very much. Because the, remember, in the Old Testament, it was all about how Israel was God's chosen people. And those people were special and unique, and they were uh, predetermined to, to be God's people. And so there's been a shift now that Jesus came, he died on the cross for the sins of everyone. So whether you're a Jew or not. And so now there's, of course, as you can imagine, and we see this in, in several places, there's great debate about this. But none of a lot of those things have really happened at this point. And so James writes to a primarily Jewish Christian audience, all right, people that were Jews that have now become Christians, follower of Christ, or they're maybe contemplating that possibility. And so he writes with this idea of growing them from the point that they have received salvation and beyond that. So as we look at this, I think that what we might say is that this is a book about spiritual maturity. Now there's a reason why I picked the word revolution, and I kind of stole it from the series because I'm watching that and it's fresh in my mind. I can relate to it. Um, because I think sometimes we hear the word spiritual maturity our eyes kind of gloss over and we're kind of like, okay, you know, here we go, kind of a thing. And so hopefully maybe uh, by looking at it with a fresh perspective that it will help you avoid that glossed over um, attitude uh, about it. So we have this introduction and then James gets right into it. And this first section is really about trials and maturity. Now, if you, as you can imagine, um, if, you, if you've seen the TV series, obviously, um, there are a lot of trials that immediately hit the human race. Where are you going to get clean drinking water? Uh, where are you going to get food from? I mean, all these basic things that we all take for granted every day, that they just show up. 
Um, I mean, we I think we had like three or four people taking a hot shower this morning all at once, and we do have two hot water heaters, uh, but they were starting to run a little bit low, and I could see, feel the water pressure, you know, kind of going down a little bit, and and it reminded me just for a brief moment that man, you know, I. I just expect that when I turn that shower head on, there's going to be hot water. And uh, when the electricity goes away and all of those things go away, then we're, we're left without some of these basic comforts uh, of life. And so in the, in the show, we, you have, of course, several characters. And I thought about maybe playing the trailer for you, but I didn't want us to get too distracted with the TV series today. So maybe next week, if you come back, uh, then, then we'll take a look at that. There's a lot of characters from the series Lost, if you've seen that. Uh, a few from Star Trek, a few from Once Upon a Time. So they, they kind of, it's J.J. Abrams, so he draws from all the best cast, all the best story writers. And they put together a pretty suspenseful story of, of this family uh, that's broken apart by all of these hardships. Um, the, the, the mom, uh, who's actually one of the characters from Lost, is kind of that... Well, my, my wife says it's blonde. I think she has like a red tint in her hair, but I don't, what do I know? Um, she's kind of the long hair blonde girl. She's in it. And, and in the show, she is captured because of what she knows about why the power went out. Because at the time, nobody knows why. I mean, all they know is that all of a sudden, in one moment in time, it all went dark. And so um, people after, you know, this is probably, I think, I want to say maybe 10 or 15 years, I may be wrong, some diehard revolution fans are going to just be eating me up on Twitter, I'm sure, here in a, in a minute, because I'm going to get some of the facts wrong, because uh, I'm still only in the first season, I'm at kind of the end of the first season, but I think it's somewhere in there, so after a while you kind of forget worrying about the why, and you're just trying to survive, and so um, she's kind of been kidnapped and taken to this, the Monroe Republic, which is one of the um, air, kind of areas, I think it'd be like the northeast part of the United States that's kind of come together. There's a Georgia Federation, there's Texas, uh, there's the, the Plains states, so there's kind of like five or six kind of sub-nations that used to be the United States, and then there's some rebels that are the, well, that consider themselves the United States militia that are kind of fighting against the tyranny of the Mo Monroe Republic, and so you can kind of put together maybe some pieces of, of all these things. But what's really happening at the heart or the essence of the show because well I like to be entertained and I like to see all the special effects I'm one of, I'm probably the a story writer's worst nightmare uh, because I'm a critic and I like to sit back and I like to think and, and ask questions you know what is the show saying uh, what's the message why does it matter uh, how does it relate to me kind of like I think we ought to do with the scriptures you know, we shouldn't just read them liturgically or out of obedience. I mean, that's, that's not bad to read them out of obedience, but we should be excited. We should be focused on it and realizing that there's relevant things for us, and we should be asking the questions. You know, why, why is it there? How does it apply to me? What, what, how will it affect my life? It's amazing how we can do that when we watch a TV series, but a lot of times when we sit down and we look at God's Word, which is infinitely more important, it's hard for us to do that. And so I think we have to kind of bring it alive. We have to think critically about it and, and understand what's being stated. So as I asked those questions in concerning the TV series, I realized that the heart of the matter is that there is this change. Change in people's lives, change in the world landscape. There's no more taking things for granted, there's no more spoiled kids, you know, mad in the morning because their, their gaming console batteries ran down, or they're complaining because they didn't get the breakfast that they wanted, but there is a survival type mindset, and so there is an emphasis placed on some of the right things. There's a war between good and evil, of course we have that now, but of course it's more of a survival type war of good and evil. And so, um, all the freedoms and things that we enjoy, just being here, being able to worship, uh, being able to uh, carry arms and all these things that are, are in our Bill of Rights, these have all gone away. And so, uh, I realized that for us as believers, God is calling us also to an internal revolution. And as I think about the book of James, it's really what it is, that James is causing us to have a revolution in our, in our heart, in our mind. To change from the person that we were before we knew Christ to the new person that God has destined for us to be. 
But there's, I mean, it takes almost a violent revolution. I, in my life, it took a violent revolution for me to get from the person that I was to the person that I am now, and I'm still in that process of overthrowing the old self so that I can realize the freedom and the truth and the peace and the joy that I know God wants me to have. So I want to challenge you that as, as we go through and we read this together over these next few weeks, that you would maybe be drawing a line in the sand. And that, just like we'll see with the cast members and a lot of the things that they go through, hardship, perseverance, pain, suffering, sometimes can be our best teachers if we will allow them to shape us and to mold us and to make us better. So let's dive in and into it. Verse 2, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. All right, now let's just pause there for a minute. Now, we see this several times in, in other letters. This, letters. this sounds like something Paul might have written a little bit. Um, it's very hard. I think, I think it sounds very Christian-y. Um, it sounds like kind of... I don't know, you know, sometimes we kind of get in this little circle and sing Kumbaya and we, we kind of forget about reality as believers and I think sometimes it's okay to do that, but sometimes I don't think we're, we're adequately following the teachings that Jesus put out there for us. He, James really considered it joy. He, he really considered it a good thing when he experienced trials. Now be honest with yourself. You don't have to be honest with me, but be honest with yourself. Do you wake up in the morning thinking, oh, it's going to be a terrible day. I'm so excited. I mean, really, I'm, I'm trying to think of the last time. Let's see. When has, has one of you said that to me? I'm thinking, thinking, never. I think actually never. I don't think I've ever heard myself or anyone else uh, say those words. And so, and so we are struggling. We need a revolution to, to really begin to thinking about, to think like that. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, why would I want to think like that? I'm a normal person, and whenever things are good, I'm happy, and whenever things are bad, I'm not happy. So what's wrong with you? And I can understand that you might be thinking that. I'm thinking of that a little bit myself. However, I've experienced just enough of hardship and difficulty to know that those things push me sometimes. They push me outside of my comfort zone. They push me beyond the limits of who I am so that I can become better. I, I have recently um, kind of gone bad to, back to woodworking a little bit in my free time that I don't really have a lot of, but I'm trying to force myself to have a little bit of free time here and there. And uh, uh, when I got back from Ukraine, uh, of course, you know, it's always... Um, a life-changing experience to to endure hardship and and to um, be challenged in in those ways and I really kind of uh, felt like God wanted me to do something more constructive in my free time than just you know watching shows like Revolution. So I have been doing more woodworking and built been a desk here a few weeks ago. I started working on a a bookshelf and. I realized, and this is, for me, this is right at 10 years. It was 10 years ago that I picked up the hobby of woodworking. I did that because, truthfully, I was kind of a video game addict a little bit. Um, not necessarily in the sense that I played them all the time, but that's just all, really all I liked to do in my free time was to play video games, computer games. So I realized, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but I realized I probably should expand my hobbies a little bit. And so uh, my father-in-law kind of got me into woodworking a little bit. My dad had woodworked with me a little bit when I was a kid. And so I had kind of dabbled in it before. And so I, uh, my wife, that year, uh, my wife got me a table saw for Christmas. And that was kind of the first real tool that I had. Uh, I had a lot of kind of wannabe tools. But I, she got me a, a DeWalt, a nice DeWalt table saw. And so I kind of started out. And it was is kind of like playing golf for those of you that are not golfers. It was just a miserable and frustrating experience. I mean, you know, have you ever tried, if, you, if you've ever tried to play golf, I mean, just getting this little ball and this very odd shaped club to go like in a certain direction and, and all that, I just, you know, it's a very frustrating thing. And that's kind of how woodworking is. It's very frustrating. There's so many variables. Uh, just making a, a clean square cut 
can just be the ultimate challenge. And so, I mean, I just made all kinds of mistakes and wasted all kinds of lumber and damaged my tools and my hands were all cut up and I, my arms were all cut up and splintered and it was just kind of a, a disaster. It was really pretty unenjoyable. Uh, I probably built several pieces of furniture until I built the bed that Michaela has now. And it was probably the first thing that actually, you know, you could lay on or sit on without wondering if you're going to die or not. And uh, and so I I realized as I th was thinking back on it this past few weeks, as I've been kind of getting back into the shop a little bit, I realized that if it hadn't been for those hardships that I endured, you know, all the cuts and scrapes and splinters and damaged tools and wasted lumber, I wouldn't be able to build the furniture that I was able to build. Uh, this, in fact, I, Ben's, I, can't, I just worked on it a few hours and all of a sudden there was a desk. And I realized, man, if I hadn't stuck with it, if I hadn't endured that hardship and the, the troubles of that, the expense of that, the time that it took to, to learn and to make those mistakes, then I wouldn't have developed the skills that I have now. Not that they're anything particularly amazing, but at least, you know, the desk has not collapsed yet. So I think this is how it is. I think that's how we live the Christian life, that we, we try, we struggle, we work for it, we become better as a result of that, and we need to learn to value the struggle, to value the hardship. Let's go on. Verse 4, But endurance must do its complete work, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. You know, when we fail to be completely mature, it's kind of like this. Have you ever have you ever been in this situation? Um, you're in a hurry. It's in the morning. Uh, you didn't have time to boil water, so you microwaved it, and you're going to put hot tea or something in there, or hot chocolate, and you just don't have time for it to get really good and hot. So you just kind of get it lukewarm, and you 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 grab it out of the microwave and you pour in your hot chocolate or you put your tea or whatever, and then you get it all stirred up, and then you go to drink it, and it's just kind of Ugh, you know, it just isn't that good hot beverage on a cold morning you were looking for. That's really how it is when we start down that path, but we just kind of quit because it gets hard, and we just don't want to mess with it anymore, or we get distracted, and we, realize, we think that there are things that are more important, and so we just kind of shove this personal revolution under the rug, and we're just like, ah, I'll deal with it at Easter or something like that. That's kind of what it's like. It's like that lukewarm hot chocolate that you really... Now you have bad breath from it, and you would rather have not even taken a drink in the first place. Verse 5, now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously, and this is an interesting statement, without criticizing, and it will be given to him. All right, so first of all, there's a source issue here in, in, this, in this sentence. The source of wisdom, the source of understanding, the source of learning from our hardships, from anything, the source of our growth, of our gaining in experience, begins with God. And that we should ask Him. We should see. And in another way, it's not like you're just going to walk up to God, knock on the door, hey God, make me smart, you know, tell me something wise so I can impress my friends. But it's this idea of seeking after Him. It's this idea of throwing aside. I mean, in a revolution, I mean, I don't know how many history, well, do you know about how many history people we have in here? Uh, you know from history that revolutions are rarely nonviolent. You know, there's usually a lot of shedding of blood, there's a lot of sacrifice, there's a lot of collateral damage. I was shocked, like I mentioned a month or so ago, I was watching this World War II in HD series. I was shocked to hear some real numbers on a couple things. Number one, um, there were 14 million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. And there were almost that many more of other minorities that were killed in over 15,000 concentration camps. I had no idea there were that many. That's a lot. All spread through Germany and Belgium and France and different areas. Austria. And did you know that when we dropped, we dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan to try to get them to stop the war, the first one killed 70,000 people in a second. 70,000 people. I mean, can you imagine being in the decision-making place 
where we knew we were going to lose at least another million uh, Marines and, and soldiers trying to attack the Japanese mainland. And so we make a decision to kill 70,000 innocent people, well, mostly innocent. That would be a difficult decision. Even though you'd be saving a lot of lives, that'd be a difficult decision. The second one that we dropped, I think there's uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the second one killed 100,000 people instantly. Men, women, and children gone, vaporized. Change is destructive. But not all change is bad. And so here, James, right out of the box, as soon as he begins writing, he addresses this. He recognizes that change is brought on us, and it's not like we all necessarily go out looking for it. I mean, some of us do, some of us don't. But it happens, it is a part of reality, and no matter how much we want things to stay the same, they change. And so we have to move on from that. We have to learn from God, who is our teacher, we have to have hope and trust in Him, not in our circumstances, and we move forward. And we don't waste the pain. You know, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and a lot of other worldwide peacekeeping organizations came as a result of, of World War II. And there's so many millions of people were killed that the leaders of the world realized that if they did not police the world, basically, that we would end up in another world war. And that's the whole purpose of a lot of these alliances and the way things ended up was, and that's why we were in Korea, that's why we're in Vietnam, that's why we're in Pakistan, that's why we're in Afghanistan, that's why we're in Iraq, and all these places, because rather than allow an evil dictator like Hitler to rise to power, we cut it off before it gets too strong. So this isn't necessarily a policy debate about whether or not we should interfere in different places. But I realized that we have a responsibility to let those hardships, to allow those, those difficulties, those sufferings that we experience to change us, to shape us, to mold us so that we're not the way we were. I mean, imagine if, if the United States had not gotten involved in the Second World War and we just ignored what was happening, how many millions more people would be killed? And would, we, would there be a such thing as a free society in our time? And so we have a responsibility, and James puts it right to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't let us be lukewarm with it. He says, this is how we need to be. If we fail, we're apart from God. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And that's a pretty harsh statement. So we have to be confident. Remember, faith is acting on what we believe. So make sure you're clear on what faith is. Faith is a verb. It's a doing statement. It's not a believing statement. It's a doing statement. So when we doubt, that's a choice to not have faith. That's a choice to not move forward. And so when we are challenged with difficulty and hardship, if we shy away from that and we back down and we just fall into a pit of depression and we try to ignore it or run away from it or feel that it's hopeless, then really we're surrendering. We're, we're being that doubter. Now that's pretty hard. That's a hard thing to listen to. Uh, there's been many times in my life where I've struggled with depression, where I've been down. Even since we planted, there's been some times, especially that first year, where I was just really discouraged. I was really down. And I doubted God. Rather than moving forward in faith, I was retreating in fear. And James says that when we do that, we shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now, earlier in the verse, and I want to touch on this before we move forward too much, 
uh, in verse 5, it mentioned that God gives wisdom to all gener generously without criticizing. And it's an interesting term because in that culture, um, when you sought out a teacher, you, you saw there, there was a lot of pride. There was a lot of, of um, you know, we, I guess we put a, a financial emphasis on education now, but back then it, it was a, I mean, you were chosen to, to be a student. It's not like you just went out, you know, well, I'll apply for this college, I'll apply for that college, or, you know, it, very haphazardly, but it was a very intentional, very serious thing. And so there was a, an accountability. There was a, a cost to gain knowledge. And here God is saying, it's given freely, and I won't criticize you for seeking it. What a blessing that is. So when we get to verse 8 then, we see this indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. And so I think we're kind of back to that lukewarm part. When we, when we freeze, when we fail to move forward, when we become indecisive, um, when we become confused, distracted, when we lose our focus, then we're unstable. And I think we'd probably freely admit that. And I think uh, in the show, in Revolution, when you see, I mean, a lot of leaders come and go, they're killed. Uh, boy, talk about change. You know, the things, I think one of the things that I hate the most in TV shows is whenever one of your favorite characters dies. Now, sometimes they come back to life, but usually they stay dead, you know, especially in like a more serious type show. And so that's very frustrating. But there's a lot of poor leadership in the show. And the consequences of that poor leadership gets a lot of people killed. A lot of civilians and a lot of people in all these different militias and, and countries killed. And the show, I think, is a great picture of what happens when instead of us being unified under one understanding of who God is, that He's the creator of all things, of understanding that we have a responsibility to love those and to help those who, who are suffering and who are in need, when we all start living for ourselves, there truly is anarchy. It is one huge disaster. And that's not the way that God has called us to live. I mean, even in the church, uh, as we've grown, uh, these last couple years, there's been some times, not a lot of times, and, and I think probably maybe I justify in my mind, well, we don't have near the strife and di disagreement and, and infighting that other churches have, so, you know, we're all right with God and we shouldn't worry about it. But as soon as we start to justify ourselves, we should realize that we're being indecisive. We're being that unstable person that James is talking about here. That God is the one that sets the standard. And so we've got to remember that we're a team. We do things together. That God's the head of the church, not any one of us. And that it's together that we strive to expand the kingdom of God. I think we've got, we've got to remember that. Because as we grow, if we're not unified, if we're not together, if we don't understand what we're trying to accomplish, then we will get fractured and splintered. And rather than bring glory to God, we will bring disgrace to His name. And so I think this is a caution to us as a church as well. Even though we're looking at this primarily individually, I think it's a good lesson for us to consider. Verse 9, the brother of humble circumstances should boast in his exaltation, but the one who is rich should boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and dries up the grass, and its flower falls off, and its beautiful appearance is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will wither away while pursuing his activities." Blessed, and I'll kind of put in a rather there probably because James is showing a contrast, is a man who endures trials because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that he has promised to those who love him. Sophie, is James the book you have memorized? Yes, it is. All right. So 
Over these next few weeks, if you're unsure about anything, if, and if I'm unsure, we'll ask Sophie. She's got it all memorized really well. Except what translation do you have it memorized in? ESV. ESV, okay. So I'm using Holman Christian, so some of these words may be a little bit different. All right, so this section really is a contrast between, and you know, what's the deal? I mean, poor rich people, they just, they always get thrown under the bus. You know, have you noticed that? It's like rich, if you're wealthy, if you have money, man, you're just, you're like this evil serpent that is always distracted and always loves everything but God, you know? Here's the deal. This is going to sting. Every one of us in this room is rich, okay? If you think you're poor, I guarantee you, you are not poor. I have met people who are poor, and they do not live in the United States. Now you may say, whoa, 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 whoa. And this isn't a debate about whether we should take care of people that are poor in our country at all. I'm not saying that at all. But here's the thing, guys. If you live in this country, whether you are a citizen or, or an alien, you can go to a homeless shelter. You can get food. You can get a place to stay. Maybe not 100% of the time, but most of the time. But when you live in South Africa, or you live in Asia, there is not food. There is not uh, protection from exposure. And there is no help. There is only death as a result of that poverty. And so, while that may sound a little offensive, that may sound a little harsh and cruel, the truth is that we are all privileged and we are all distracted by our wealth. I mean, I was distracted this morning because the hot water started to, to wane a little bit in my shower. So James, he warns us, he cautions us, we who are rich. See, when I read that, I always tune out because I don't consider myself rich. I'm thinking of the, the person that lives in the big city in the penthouse or the person that has the big you know, ranch out on 100 acres and it's got a 20,000 square foot house. I don't even know what you call that. That's like really rich. You know, That was an original designation, wasn't it? All right, but, but we are that person. You know, don't be like, oh, I'm looking over here, or you're looking over there. Oh, this is talking about those people, so I'm just going to take a minute and send a text message because it doesn't apply to me. This is us, guys. We are wealthy. And so we are, we are given this caution that sometimes we can buy our way out of hardship, can't we? Or we can pay someone else to fix something for us. I think that's the problem. That we have a choice sometimes where we can get out of jail free. But James challenges us to confront the trial and to allow that trial to change us. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to go back here in verse 12 and read from there. For blessed is a man who endures trials, because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that he has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should stay. I am being tempted by God. All right, now let's just talk about this. Now this particular trial, obviously this being talking about is, is towards sin. All right, so it's not necessarily enduring a hardship, but it's it's enduring either the choice of temptation or the consequences of sin. And I think this is a very, this is worthy of underlining, all right, in your phone or your Bible. God does not tempt us. Only the enemy tempts us. Only our own flesh tempts us. So sometimes we, we struggle when we talk about free will, we talk about Calvinism, we talk about different ideas of the sovereignty of God, and we get confused, and when somebody dies, I don't know I mean, how many times in a movie, somebody will say, well, it must have been God's will, or it was their time to go. Guys, that is nowhere in the scriptures. God is a good God. He made everything good. He made everything perfect. It is not his will that everyone should endure harsh calamity. And that is why Jesus came and died on the cross, and someday there won't be any more. And so we need to remember that God is not the one that brings calamity upon us. Now, sometimes He brings consequences for our sin. Sometimes He allows consequences for our sin. So it's not like if we're Christians, we're not going to experience hardship. That's not what James is saying. But he's saying that God will never tempt you. So if you are tempted, it is an issue of your flesh, or it is an issue of the enemy. That He does not... 
stand around and go, oh, well, who should I tempt today? Let's see if they're really loyal and faithful to me. Mm, how, about, how about Les? How about Paul? How about Melissa? How about Suzanne? I'm going to try to stump them today. You know, God desires that we live righteous and holy lives. And in fact, I believe that He delivers us often from temptation. I mean, why do you think Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from temptation? That we're asking that of God because God has the power sometimes to shield us from those temptations. Going on, for God is not tempted by evil, and He Himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Boy, isn't that the way that it happens? We're drawn away, all right? We get frustrated with church. We get frustrated in our families. And so Satan kind of draws us away from our Christian friends, and we get kind of drawn away, kind of isolated over here. Maybe things aren't going so good at work. Maybe things aren't going so good in different places in our life. And then we're enticed. Sometimes we're enticed to partake of a worldly pleasure. Sometimes we're enticed to reject living for God. In fact, I think for many of us, that's one of the greatest temptations. We get so frustrated with church, or we get frustrated with our own personal ministry. We get frustrated because somebody didn't say hi to you in the right way. And so you get, you just like, well, fine, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm just not going to cook my chicken and bring it to church. I'm not going to, you know, send the pastor an encouraging note this week. I'm not going to sing. I'm not, you know, we get this, well, I'm not going to, but we get enticed. The enemy deceives us, and we get enticed to walk away from the things that God has called us to do. Then, verse 15, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dearly loved brothers. And we're going to have to kind of read through all this because we're running out of time. Every generous act and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with Him there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. By His own choice, He gave us a new birth by the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits of his creatures. Now let's just camp on this last part before we end today. There's three things that are being said here. First of all, his own choice, he gave us a new birth. God has given us, he has started a revolution in our lives. And for each of us, we're in a different place in that great battle. But he has started that re revolution. The moment that he ended the fatality of sin on the cross is the moment that the potentiality for us to be free from that bondage began. So maybe that's just, just a fancy way of saying that God elected to redeem us, to deliver us, but it's not going to happen without a fight. As Americans, we did not win our independence because we wrote the Declaration of Independence. That was the catalyst that started the revolution. The catalyst. And if it weren't for the sacrifices of our forefathers, the, the men and women that came before us, we would not be here enjoying these things that we're enjoying right now. We would all be Anglicans for one. And so there is a cost of following Jesus. This revolution is violent and bloody and messy and complicated. And it takes time. It takes a lot of time. There's very few exceptions of revolutions that happen or have happened over the last hundreds or thousands of years that just happened overnight. They take years. It takes years. For those changes to be made through the trials and, and the failures. Um, I, I can't remember if I've mentioned this on Sunday morning or not, but one of the main reasons that Lincoln won the Civil War is because the, of the telegraph. 
The telegraph gave Lincoln the ability to know the results of battles right after they had happened. And if you know anything about commanding troops or being a general, that, that being a good commander is all about understanding where your weaknesses are and strengthening them and understanding where your enemy's weaknesses are and exploiting them. And so that gave Lincoln the ability to go in and, and while the, the South was having to wait days or weeks to hear what happened in battles because they're waiting for people on horseback to deliver the information, Lincoln was able to make decisive decisions that gave the North a huge advantage. And so I think it's a lesson for us to realize that the truths that God pours out for us the wisdom that he offers us is something that we must embrace decisively. The second part, he gives us a new birth by the message of truth. The message of truth is the gospel. The message of truth is the understanding that we no longer are captive, we're no longer slaves to sin. That we can choose to act otherwise. And the, th and the final part of this so that we would be the first fruits of his creatures. And when we see that word first fruits, he's basically saying that there is a uniqueness, there is a specialness about something. That's why when we tithe today, hopefully we all faithfully gave the first 10% of everything that we made in this last week. That's what God's called us to do, commanded us to do, to give the first fruits, the best of what we earned and had to give is what we gave. And yet we are God's first fruits. We are unique among all the other animals and all the other creatures on the earth in that God gave us one thing that none of them have, and that's free will. He gave us the ability to know God. That's why in, the, in Genesis when it says that, that, we are created, that God created us in His likeness and that we are given this unique free will. And what have we done with it? To this point, we have made a disaster of God's creation. We've, we've wrecked it and brought death and suffering and evil. But God has redeemed us. But he has called us to fight a vicious and, and, and hard-fought revolution in our lives. And so, we're going to close. And then if you'll come and, and play for us here at the end. I want to challenge you guys with something very simple. There, there were those, even in the American Revolution, that chose to sit on the sidelines. They chose not to make uniforms. They chose not to fight. They chose not to make food or do anything that supported the rebel army. We have that same choice. Even though God, even in these few 18 verses that we've looked at today, has called us to a great calling. And he has challenged us to be a part of this revolution in our lives. We still have a choice to opt out. And so I'm asking you today, as your friend, as your brother, as your pastor, as someone who cares about you, to engage in this great conflict. It's your life. No one can make you better except for you and God working together to throw out the old things, to overthrow the old government in your heart and to put in place something that is good and new and right. So David, would you bring down the lights and let's just take a few moments I guess really what I'm asking you to do is between you and God in prayer to decide if, if you will either continue this, if you're already on this path and you today you realize, man, I just I need to continue on. Or maybe you, you accepted Christ and you said, yeah, I want to follow Jesus, but for several days or months or years, you've just not really gotten involved in the fight at all. You just kind of sat on the sidelines and let other people live and die. And looked at ignorance. So this is a call away from that. And to face the truth that is in your life. So I'll be silent for just a moment. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes so we're not distracted by all the things around us. Or even though I
it's hard, and even though I'm really struggling to mean this, I do thank you for the trials and for the hardships in my life. And God, I pray that you would change me, that I would declare war on all the lusts of the flesh and all the sinful desires in my heart, and that I would be resolved to pay whatever cost is required that are following after you. More than just what they say, more than just what's on a sheet of paper, but what's in their heart. And we ask that, God, you would give us the strength, that you would give us the faith that we lack. We wouldn't get so caught up in our work and our hobbies